Second part of chapter 11 of the first volume of The Life of Reason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fredrik Karlsson. The Life of Reason by George Santayana. Side note. Need of unity and finality. Side note. Ideals of nothing. No less important, however, than this basis which the ideal must have in extant demands is the harmony with which reason must endow it. If without the one the ideal loses its value, without the other it loses its finality. Human nature is fluid and imperfect. Its demands are expressed in incidental desires, elicited by a variety of objects which perhaps cannot coexist in the world. If we merely transcribe these miscellaneous demands, or allow these floating desires to dictate to us the elements of the ideal, we shall never come to a whole or to an end. One new fancy after another will seem an embodiment of perfection and we shall contradict each expression of our ideal by every other a certain school of philosophy if we may give that name to the systematic neglect of reason has so immersed itself in the contemplation of this sort of inconstancy which is indeed prevalent enough in the world that it has mistaken it for a normal and necessary process. The greatness of the ideal has been put in its vagueness and in an elasticity which makes it wholly indeterminate and inconsistent. The goal of progress, beside being thus made to lie at every point of the compass in succession, is removed to an infinite distance, whereby the possibility of attaining it is denied and progress itself is made illusory for a progress must be directed to attaining some definite type of life the counterpart of a given natural endowment and nothing can be called an improvement which does not contain an appreciable benefit a victory would be a mockery that left us for some new reason as much impeded as before and as far removed from peace the picture of life as an eternal war for illusory ends was drawn at first by satirists unhappily with too much justification in the facts some grosser minds too undisciplined to have ever pursued a good either truly attainable or truly satisfactory then proceeded to mistake that satire on human folly for a sober account of the whole universe and finally others were not ashamed to represent it as the ideal itself so soon is the dyer's hand subdued to what it works in a barbarous mind cannot conceive life like health as a harmony continually preserved or restored and containing those natural and ideal activities which disease merely interrupts such a mind never having tasted order cannot conceive it and identifies progress with new conflicts and life with continual death its deification of unreason instability and strife comes partly from piety and partly from inexperience there is piety in saluting nature in her perpetual flux and in thinking that since no equilibrium is maintained for ever none perhaps deserves to be there is inexperience in not considering that wherever interests and judgments exist the natural flux has fallen so to speak into a vortex and created a natural good a cumulative life and an ideal purpose art science government human nature itself are self-defining and self-preserving by partly fixing a structure they fix an ideal but the barbarian can hardly regard such things for to have distinguished and fostered them would be to have founded a civilization 
Sidenote. Darwin on Moral Sense. Reason's function in defining the ideal is in principle extremely simple. Although all time and all existence would have to be gathered in before the applications of that principle could be exhausted. A better example of its essential working could hardly be found than one which Darwin gives to illustrate the natural origin of moral sense. A swallow, impelled by migratory instincts to leave a nest full of unfledged young, would endure a moral conflict. The more lasting impulse, memory being assumed, would prompt a moral judgment when it emerged again after being momentarily obscured by an intermittent passion. Quote, While the mother bird is feeding or brooding over her nestlings, the maternal instinct is probably stronger than the migratory, but the instinct which is more persistent gains the victory, and at last, at a moment when her young ones are not in sight, she takes flight and deserts them. When arrived at the end of her long journey and the migratory instinct ceases to act, what an agony of remorse each bird would feel if, from being endowed with great mental activity, she could not prevent the image continually passing before her mind of her young ones perishing in the bleak north from cold and hunger. End quote. Footnote E. Descent of Man. Chapter 3 she would doubtless upbraid herself like any sinner for a senseless perfidy to her own dearest good the perfidy however was not wholly senseless because the forgotten instinct was not less natural and necessary than the remembered one and its satisfaction no less true temptation has the same basis as duty the difference is one of the volume and permanence in the rival satisfactions, and the attitude conscience will assume toward these depends more on the representability of the demands compared than on their original vehemence or ultimate results. Side note. Conscience and reason compared. A passionate conscience may thus arise in the play of impulses differing in permanence without involving a judicial exercise of reason. Nor does such a conscience involve a synthetic ideal, but only the ideal presence of particular demands. Conflicts in the conscience are thus quite natural and would continually occur but for the narrowness that commonly characterizes a mind inspired by passion. A life of sin and repentance is as remote as possible from a life of reason. Yet the same situation which produces conscience and the sense of duty is an occasion for applying reason to action and for forming an ideal so soon as the demands and satisfactions concerned are synthesized and balanced imaginatively. The stork might do more than feel the conflict of his two impulses. He might do more than embody in alternation the eloquence of two hostile thoughts. He might pass judgment upon them impartially and, in the felt presence of both, conceive what might be a union or compromise between them. This resultant object of pursuit, conceived in reflection and it itself the initial goal of neither impulse, is the ideal of a mind occupied by the two. It is the aim prescribed by reason under the circumstances. It differs from the prescriptions of conscience in that conscience is often the spokesman of one interest or of a group of interests in opposition to other primary impulses which it would annul altogether. While reason and the ideal are not active forces nor embodiments of passion at all, but merely a method by which objects of desire are compared in reflection. The goodness of an end is felt inwardly by conscience. By reason it can be only taken up in trust and registered as a fact. For conscience, the object of an opposed will is an evil. For reason, 
it is a good on the same ground as any other good because it is pursued by a natural impulse and can bring a real satisfaction conscience in fine is a party to moral strife reason an observer of it who however plays the most important and beneficent part in the outcome by suggesting the terms of peace this suggested peace inspired by sympathy and by knowledge of the world is the ideal which borrows its value and practical force from the irrational impulses which it embodies and borrows its final authority from the truth with which it recognizes them all and the necessity by which it imposes on each such sacrifices as are requisite to a general harmony Side note, reason imposes no new sacrifice could each impulse apart from reason gain perfect satisfaction it would doubtless laugh at justice the divine to exercise suasion must use an argumentum ad hominem reason must justify itself to the heart but perfect satisfaction is what an irresponsible impulse can never hope for all other impulses though absent perhaps from the mind are none the less present in nature and have possession of the field through their physical basis they offer effectual resistance to a reckless intruder to disregard them is therefore to gain nothing reason far from creating the partial renunciation and proportionate sacrifices which it imposes really minimizes them by making them voluntary and fruitful the ideal which may seem to wear so severe a throne really fosters all possible pleasures what it retrenches is nothing to what blind forces and natural catastrophes would otherwise cut off while it sweetens what it sanctions adding to spontaneous enjoyments a sense of moral security and an intellectual light side note natural goods attainable and compatible in principle those who are guided only by an irrational conscience can hardly understand what a good life would be their utopias have to be supernatural in order that the irresponsible rules which they call morality may lead by miracle to happy results but such a magical and undeserved happiness if it were possible would be unsavoury only one phase of human nature would be satisfied by it and so impoverished an ideal cannot really attract the will for human nature has been moulded by the same natural forces among which its ideal has to be fulfilled and apart from a certain margin of wild hopes and extravagances the things man's heart desires are attainable under his natural conditions and would not be attainable elsewhere the conflict of desires and interests in the world is not radical any more than man's dissatisfaction which his own nature can be for every particular ideal being an expression of human nature in operation must in the end involve the primary human faculties and cannot be essentially compatible with any other ideal which involves them too to adjust all demands to one ideal and adjust that ideal to its natural conditions in other words to live the life of reason is something perfectly possible for those demands being akin to one another in spite of themselves can be better furthered by cooperation than by blind conflict while the ideal far from demanding any profound revolution in nature merely expresses her actual tendency and forecasts what her perfect functioning would be side note harmony the formal and intrinsic demand of reason reason as such represents or rather constitutes a single formal interest 
the interest in harmony. When two interests are simultaneous and fall within one act of apprehension, the desirability of harmonizing them is involved in the very effort to realize them together. If attention and imagination are steady enough to face this implication and not to allow impulse to oscillate between irreconcilable tendencies, reason comes into being. Henceforth things actual and things desired are confronted by an ideal which has both pertinence and authority. End of chapter 11